All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome wherever you're coming in from. Uh, my name is Sarah Dukevich, and we're going to talk about clean architecture with .NET 8. So Steve Ardalis uh, maintains this clean architecture template, and he has updated it for .NET 8. So we'll talk about basically the general what is clean architecture, and then how has the template changed, and how does the template make it easier for us to organize our code using clean architecture concepts. So just to get everybody on the same page when we talk about the clean architecture. So the goal is to minimize the human part and make it so it's easier to build and maintain system. Again, the agenda. So talk about clean architecture at a high level. Then we'll look at the what's in the template, any prereqs, how to install it. And then I'll take you through, let's run and create a brand new project or a brand new solution and what's included in the solution. So we'll walk through the steps for that. Now I'll also show the sample and how do you get that? And then finally, additional resources and how to reach us. But first let's talk about the clean architecture. So what is clean architecture? Other terms you may hear are things like onion architecture or hexagonal architecture, which is ports and adapters. Uh, and my next slide, I'll show you why they call it hexagonal. But then there are other architecture things out there like boundary control entity and data context and interaction. These are all related to clean architecture. Basically, you're separating your business logic from the technical decisions. Uh, the key you'll hear is it's a domain-centric approach. When I, when I say domain, I'm not talking like nimblepros.com or anything like that or deviq.com. I'm not talking about those, not, not domains that you're going to like a website kind of deal. No, domains are your business domain, your business area, uh, the topic of what are you trying to solve. So this is hexagonal architecture. My hexagons aren't always as straight or as even, but it is still a hexagon. Uh, so at the center, we have our core project. This here, this is where we have our domain and any abstractions are there. Now they call this ports and adapters because you can see things plugging in from the various sides. So the way you'll see it here is you've got like a web project that refers to the core project. The test projects can refer to the core project. The infrastructure project, I'm uh, missing an arrow that should also go to the core project, but the infrastructure also manages our data calls. So hexagonal architecture, again, they call it that because of the shape that was drawn when they drew it. But the other term you hear with hexagonal architecture is ports and adapters. Because the ports are what you're plugging in, the adapters are fitting the adapters. All right, so when would you use clean architecture? If you're already doing domain-driven design, then using clean architecture will feel like something that naturally fits because it is a domain-centric approach. Uh, if you need to have a solution that's highly testable, clean architecture has it already baked into it. In fact, this template will have different types of tests with some tests already written. When else would you use this? The stress is on complex business logic. If you're doing something super simple, then keep your code simple. Don't overcomplicate your code just for the sake of, of this. But if you have complex business logic, something that needs to be easy to maintain, easy to scale, then you want to consider looking at something like clean architecture. And the architecture will help enforce policy. So that's another case where you need the clean architecture uh, setup. Now, there are two different ways or thoughts to think about this. So that's why we drew out the overall menu, uh, model for it. So N tier, this is what we're used to probably when you're dealing with like CRUD apps and things like that, is you have a UI. The UI will deal with the business logic. Business logic will handle calls to the data access. Data access makes the calls to the database. So this you'll hear is N tier. Clean architecture, notice the business logic is here. It's in the domain. Both the UI project and the infrastructure project can refer back to the domain. 
And then you'll have the database where the infrastructure manages the handling of the, the wiring up of that database. Okay, so when you're working with clean architecture, some of the, the rules that Ardalis mentioned are things like modeling the business rules and the entities in the core project. So when we look at the actual projects that are included in our solution, you're going to see core, you're going to see infrastructure, use cases, and web. Core is where it starts. Core should have no external dependencies or very few. And when I say very few, I'm talking about it can refer to things on the outside for different libraries, but core should not know anything about infrastructure. Core should not know anything about use cases. Core should not know anything about web. Web, web will know in this particular example, it knows about use cases and infrastructure. You may have seen where sometimes you'll see web refer to core. Things can refer to core, but core should not refer to the projects that are outside of it. So core is again, your entities, your models, your business rules, things that are central to that application. All the dependencies are gonna to flow towards core. So the inner projects, they'll have the interfaces, but the actual implementations of those interfaces are gonna happen somewhere else. Possibly here, possibly here, depending on what you're trying to implement. We'll take a look at how that looks in our code. Now, today, the focus on our webinar is actually our Dallas's clean architecture template and the changes that have been made since we last did this webinar. So we did the webinar back in May of 2023, and that was a much different version of the template. Things have been removed, things have been added. So you'll hear that I mentioned the use cases layer. That's a new one. Um, core infrastructure and web were there before. This template is an opinionated approach, so this is what our Dallas had said, this is the way he's going to organize the code. And it makes sense because it does a lot of the, the separation of concerns. It makes it easy for us to get started right away rather than having to manually do all the piping and plumbing, which is good. Um, you can see here that I call out that there are some design decisions that are already made. That's why I say it's the opinionated approach. You'll see a lot of features for domain-driven development. There are going to be terms that I will high level define, but I won't deep dive into. And that's because they're related to domain driven development. We had a webinar on that back in July of 2023 that is available on demand. Uh, and we also have another course coming up for that very shortly. So domain driven development and understanding the, the little building blocks that's coming soon as well. Um, and in our responses or in our uh, email that you get with this uh, webinar. so. At the end of the webinar, you get a link to the recording, plus the links that you'll see in the slides, any of the relationships and supporting notes. Um, we'll make sure to mention our domain-driven development stuff coming up as well. But DDD is, is tied in here. Now, what version of the .NET do you need for working with our Dallas's clean architecture template? You can go as low as .NET 2.0. Uh, the newer ones are .NET 8. And so what I'm going to show today is .NET 8. There are different versions. So these versions were tagged as of yesterday. If they have changed, you would have changed this morning. But I didn't see anything when I checked. Uh, so there's version 8 and version 9 are the, are the majors. 801 and 901 came out at the end of November. But with those, we talk about there's going to be the use cases project as part of that update. I don't remember what else, but we have some notes to share with that. So today we're looking at .NET 8. We'll look at version 9 and 901 of the template. So what's included? Again, there's going to be two folders, source and tests. Uh, you could tell with my illustration that I actually am very specific with the name too. So this is my .NET 8 demo. That way, if you come back to this presentation recording and you're like, wait, what version is this again? I got you covered. Very intentional in that. But you can see there's core, infrastructure, use cases, and web. And then functional tests, integration tests, and unit tests. So this has already got testing baked in to make it a lot easier. And it's already got project references set up for infrastructure and use cases and web. 
So you don't have to worry about connecting those. So you got loosely coupled testable code. When we're looking at core, you're going to see aggregates, interfaces, and services. When we look at infrastructure, I'll show you the data access. We've got use cases. Uh, that's the newer project in there with commands and handlers and queries and query services. So if you're familiar with the CQRS pattern, you'll be putting your queries and your commands in the use cases folder. And we'll look at, I'll show you all of these folders. We'll take a look at the code live. And then there was a web project. Now, if you're familiar with the previous version of the clean architecture template, that template had like a sample mini application or like a to-do app. Uh, that is not in the template itself. That's in a sample. And we will, I'll show you where that went so you can see where it is. But just so you're aware, if you've used the clean architecture template before and have run it and have been like, oh yeah, there's a mini app with a, a web UI and some other things, those got cleaned out. So there's no more web UI. It's an API with some CRUD for the contributors object. So when I say CRUD, I talk about create, read, update, and delete. All right, so where did that sample to do app go? Rest assured, it's still there, it's in sample. But when you do a .NET new clean arch, you're not gonna have that sample as part of that template. It's been removed out of the template. So it's in the GitHub repo, and I will show you that. So I have that open in my full-fledged Visual Studio. And then I'll also show you what happens when I create a new template using Visual Studio code. All right, so core project, let's talk about what's in the, the core project. Uh, few to no external dependencies. Core should not know about the other projects, but the other projects can know about it. Core does not link back to infrastructure. It does not link back to web. It doesn't link to use cases, but all three of those could know about core. Now what's in core? So entities, uh, value objects, aggregates, things like that. You've got your domain events and event handlers especially if you're dealing with that internally like that, that's where those two go. Validators and custom guard clauses, all of that information will go in your core project. Now, when I did this back in May of 2023 with the previous version, one of the questions I had is, well, what about CQRS? CQRS is fine. And now we actually have a good spot to talk about that, which is the use cases project. When I demo that, I'll show you that we have the commands and the command handlers for create, update, and delete. Then we have the queries and uh, some things with the queries for get and list. So it's very distinct which commands, which queries are getting called and how they're getting handled. The use cases project. So this is where we're we'll see commands and queries. You'll see their DTOs and the behaviors. You'll see the handlers for the queries and the commands are also there. Now, the example that Steve likes to use, there's a, a spot in the sample app where you're talking about marking a to-do item complete. And you'll get to see that it uses the specification. It'll fire off a domain event and the domain event is handled. So, and with domain events, those are used to track, like if there's a state change, then you fire that off and then whoever subscribed to that event uh, will end up handling it whatever way they need to. Now with infrastructure, so this implements any of the interfaces that are defined in core. So core could say something like, I have a, a need to do email. So some kind of I email uh, interface, but then in the infrastructure, you get into the specifics. So we get into things like an actual email implementation or an SMS implementation. Uh, you can do an in-memory implementation. You'll see those implementations of the interfaces are in the infrastructure. Same thing here, if you're trying to store data in different locations. So then the file system and the Azure storage accessors, so those are two different ways to store your data. But you could have the actual interface for that in core. The other thing that we show in our infrastructure project is where we are tied to EF core for our data layer. So that goes in infrastructure as well. 
All right, and then we have our web project. So another way of thinking about the web project, that's your UI layer. The configuration has a lot of settings and app settings.json to make things work. Um, and then there's, you're going to see some dependency injection that's actually handled by infrastructure. So if you're like, well, how does this all work? These are the different layers. These are how they get fired off and how they get wired up and plumbed and connected. Now in the web project, so yeah, that's where you're going to see like your API models, your API endpoints. You're going to see, so view models and views, API models, those are very specific to the UI. That's why they appear in the web project and not in the core. So if it were something shared across multiple layers, then it might make sense to go in core. Now there's a question from Spitali about would it be possible to get rid of Autofac and use standard DI for Microsoft? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you use a different uh, setup for your DI, you should be able to just go back and take that out. Uh, it would be in the infrastructure project. So if you look in the infrastructure project, and I'll show you that when we look at the projects in the code, that way you can see it. Now the previous template had this shared kernel project going on, but Steve's been talking about this for a while, how he was going to get rid of shared kernel and remove it out of the clean architecture. And he finally did it. So he's got a new standalone package. It's at github.com slash ardalis slash ardalis dot shared kernel. So the shared kernel itself, it's nice when you have shared components that you have between multiple projects. Uh, but this, the thing he talks about is publish it as a new Git package. So he finally made it a standalone. He also did blog about it in his blog about removing shared kernel and the updates for V8 of this template. So V8 came out in between our last template and uh, webinar in this one, and now we're at V9. So some of the changes came out in V8, some came in V9. And I tried to capture them as best as I could here. All right, so how do we get started? .NET. The .NET CLI is going to be the easiest way to do it. Uh, you install using the .NET new install. You can specify a version if you need to. It's double colon after the template and then the version. And the version numbers are, again, what appeared on my version slide. Or you can see it on the NuGet gallery link. And that'll show you the different versions available. So if you don't specify a version, it's going to get the latest. So if you do .NET new install or dallas.cleanarchitecture.template, right now it should be v.9.0.1. And that's the version that you'll see with the demos. All right, so using the template, uh, basically you'll run the, the .NET new. I can't stress this enough. We're still at a point where no dashes are allowed in the solution folder name. This is not a problem with the clean architecture template. This is beyond Steve and his repo. This is something at the .NET level. Um, it is something where you do this with any template besides the clean architecture template, and you'll see some funkiness with underscores versus dashes. Um, so when you create a new solution, give it a good solution folder name without the dashes. And then if you're not set to restore dependencies, automatically do a .NET restore. OK, so this is to install the template. And then there we go. So we'll create the new solution. You can see here, we'll create it. Well, go into the folder. And so there's like a solution file, the source and the tests, the standard layout. This is all done and generated for you. But this is why I want to warn you right now before we go into the demo, is that if you do a dash in your name, this is the kind of error message you'll see. You will see something right here where it talks about underscores, but you'll notice that the file paths actually have dashes. So Microsoft and its templating right now is still broken. 
Don't use dashes. All right, let's go look at the code. And I did stop sharing a moment. Let's pull up my Visual Studio code. That's this one here. Okay. Well, it should be readable. Spitali, can you see? I've actually sure, got a visual sure. on you, so does that look good? Cool. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. So I have, I'm in this cleanarch.net 8 folder, as you can see in the Explorer, and there's nothing in it right now. So that's the whole no tricks up my sleeves kind of deal like I always do. No tricks. You can do this as I can. All right. I already have the template installed. So if I try to do a .NET new uh, let's, uh, clean dash arch, I'm going to say I wanted to call the nimble pros webinar.demo. No dashes. Do you want to see what happens if I do a dash just so you can see it live? OK, we'll do that then. We'll put the change I thought the dash. You all know I like to bring some of the brokenness so you can see it in action. All right, so the template, the solution was created fine. I'm in Visual Studio Code, so code is not going to complain because it's not doing some stuff where it opens the projects and things like that. Uh, so we're OK to this point in code. If I were in Visual Studio, Visual Studio would go kaboom, because I try to open the solution, and the solution links are broken. But I can get as far here, and let's say I want to go into my source folder. And then I want, oh, I got to actually go into the Nimble Pros webinar demo folder, and then into the source folder, and then into the Nimble Pros webinar web folder. And I'm going to do a .NET start or a .NET run. This is where it'll go kaboom in here. So in Visual Studio, it breaks right away because the solution and the projects and the links are broken. In Visual Studio Code, you can go a little bit further, but you'll notice here that it's talking about it can't find namespaces, Nimble Pros webinar underscore demo. It's still gross. It's still a mess. Now, fine. So remove, uh, let's go back up a couple folders. And I'm going to do a remove dash recurse dash force. I'm in PowerShell. So that's all you're seeing. At, uh, oh, that didn't require it before. Recurse it. Oh, not filter. I want force. Use the force. That's better. OK, it's like, why is it prompting me? So then again, no tricks up my sleeve. You'll see the Explorer is cleared out. If I do a list stuff, ls, nothing comes back. That's expected. So now let's try this again. So we're going to do a .NET new clean arch dash n nimble pros webinar dot demo instead of the dash. OK, so now it's created. Again, this part's not going to complain because code it, code's not going through the solution and trying to do all the links. Uh, but again, to show no tricks up my sleeve, so go into Nimble Pros source, Nimble Pros web, and do a .NET run. And you'll see that it's doing some running stuff. And of course, you'll see the things like there's the EF core running the commands. So we're good there. Uh, it's now list, listening on here. So that's all good. Uh, I guess while I'm in here and running this, I can show you something that's included. So if I go into my source and I go into my web, do you see this API HTTP file? So .http files, if you're doing web development, .http files are amazing for being able to do things like testing your API. 
Um, I am using a REST client extension in Visual Studio Code, or I can then tell it, send a request. And then this is the response I get from the API. So HTTP files, really love using those. I uh, used to use a couple other tools for debugging APIs, but the fact that now I can check this into source control, and now my teammates can also test our APIs using the same file, it makes it easy. If I have variables, they're up here at the top. They're not buried in some kind of tabbed interface where I'm like, where do I have to find this again? And how is this set again? It's right in the HTTP files. Uh, when I send the, the thank you email afterwards, I will also include a link in Microsoft's documentation for HTTP files because they're supported in Visual Studio. And we'll see that when I run the sample. All right. Thank you. Sure. I'll go ahead and stop this. Okay, that way we're not .NET running in the background. And I'm gonna flip over to Visual Studio just because it looks prettier and we'll, we'll take it into the sample. So let's do that. Visual Studio. Actually, before I go to Visual Studio, let me show you where this is in GitHub. All right, so back to sharing that. Okay, so this is the clean architecture repo. Um, this is on GitHub. It's under our Dallas clean architecture. And I wanted to show you, so as I mentioned in the slides, the sample is no longer part of the, uh, when we do the template and do .NET new, the sample's gone. However, there's a sample folder here in the repo. So you can clone the repo or you can download the code. And then when you do that, you can take a look and you can see what's going on in the samples. I've already downloaded this repo and I have it open here in my Visual Studio. So you can see with Visual Studio, I'm gonna open up Solution Explorer a little bit more so we can see that. Okay. So, what you should see is we've got our, our build and packages props are at the solution level, new spec is at the solution level. We've got our editor config file, but then we also have, okay, so let's close these. We have our source and our tests. Now, again, this is the sample. This is that sample folder from GitHub in order to be able to see this. And what this has, so if we look at the web folder, is it opening all these things? Let's close them all. My solution in Explorer is not docked where I want it. All right, fine. Right there for now. Okay. So this particular file, let me just close it. The sharing button is on top of all the things that I'm trying to close. So let's stop sharing a minute so we make this a little bit easier. Okay. I can close that and reshare the screen. Okay, zoom. Okay. You should see Visual Studio now with the Solution Explorer to the right. And it should be clear. Awesome. All right. So the web application you'll notice here also has this API.http. Ignore that the send request is on top of the get. Right now, I have a larger font for when I work in Visual Studio, because usually I'm working on a tiny screen with very little font. So I have to zoom my font. And in the process, it stops on it. <laughs> so this is what the API HTTP file looks like in Visual Studio with Zoom font. Now, what does this mean for us here? This means that I can come into my developer command prompt. Maybe it'll let me do it. I should be able to go into the web. Uh, so I'm in the sample folder and I should be able to go into the 
uh, let's go back. Uh, okay. So I should be able to go into the sample uh, web. So source and web and do my .NET run. Again, running the sample. Notice it started much quicker until it send request. So let's close this out and scoot this over so you can see what this looks like. So the HTTP file is in Visual Studio. Again, it'll have the send request and debug automatically there. So you can see this and then you can see, okay, this is my formatted response. This is my raw response. These are the headers. So whenever you're dealing with API debugging, these are the kinds of things that you're wondering, like, what did I send in that request? We've got some gets, but let's look at the post. So if I do a post and then I do a send request for the post, we'll see that I posted, we're going to send a new person. Their name is John Doe. I didn't send the ID, but the ID came back in the response. So the server did its thing and it returned an object back. And then we have here the response, how long it took. You can see this is the raw that came back. So it already did some JSON for us. And then again, what did I send? What does that look like? And you can see I sent it as JSON. So basically you, you don't need Postman anymore. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Okay. Uh, so for me, I, I used to love using Postman for API debugging, uh, but because of the whole checking things into source control and not having to figure out where is a variable set and not having to go, okay, this variable is going to be shared across controls, I can just specify that in here up top. That makes a world of difference. That's a game changer. So I don't fire up Postman as much as I used to anymore. It's now coming to HTTP files because it's so much easier to share with my teammates. Cool. So that's, I was excited when I saw that was one of the changes that Steve made to the template because that makes it easier for us to work in debugging APIs if we really had to. Uh, this particular uh, sample also gets into, so there's the contributors, the contributor records but there's also the projects too. So that whole sample to do list that they had talked about in the previous version, this is just the API version of it. So you can see all the different things. And again, the API HTTP file, if you want to check any of the endpoints, you can go right ahead and you can see it gets into the, there's the projects and adding those projects. And Visual Studio, that's okay. Because I'm running the application and it wanted to Start it again. That's okay. Okay. So let's actually take a look at the other folders so you can see how they're structured. So I mentioned the infrastructure and I wanted to point this out because this goes back to Dali's question about the dependency injection. And this is where it happens here is we have this autofac infrastructure module. And so you can see how we've got it all hooked into the system. There's the add to assemblies, things like that. So this is how we have to wire up Autofact for dependency injection. So if you want to use your own dependency injection um, framework rather than using Autofact, you want to come into this layer to deal with it. Uh, I also mentioned that infrastructure is going to implement interfaces that live in core. So while we're also in infrastructure, I'll show you that we have these email senders, and they implement this iEmail sender. Where is iEmail sender? iEmail sender is in our core project. So core sets the interfaces, that's the inner project. The outer projects implement the interfaces. So that's why infrastructure is like, okay, I've got this. I'll give you an email sender. This also deals with our AppDB context for the data side of things. So when we go into that, uh, just to be aware of what we've got. So this is where we set for entity framework. This is where your DB sets are set up. Uh, if, for example, you're using Postgres, so I think by default we're using SQL Lite for the in-memory, um, but I have a, there's a project that I'm on right now that uses Postgres. We have to come into the infrastructure setup. And when we come into here, this is where we set up things like there's a problem with Postgres where it translates all of its queries to lowercase. 
which is bad when you have the, the, the models here, for example, are going to follow the Pascal case. <sighs> so then when you write your Postgres queries, it's like select star and you need a lot of double quotes around fields and things like that. It's, it's a mess. Um, but you can alleviate some of that mess using uh, EF core naming conventions library, which I have a blog post about that on the Nimble Pros blog. I'll include that in the, our, our thank you email as well to help you on, okay, you're using clean architecture. You want to use Postgres. What are the gotchas? I got you on that. And I'll tell you how to set that up in that blog post. But it's basically here in the infrastructure, you have to set that up. So infrastructure, think of it as if there are interfaces and in core that are related to the infrastructure side of things, then they're going to be implemented here in infrastructure. Some of the things you'll see in infrastructure, we've got some config. You can see here, this is configuring our uh, entity types. We've got our data schema. So we have some constants in here. Again, more configuration. If there's a lot of configuration, that'll probably have, uh, hand, uh, bleh, happen in your infrastructure if it's related to the infrastructure stuff. So data, emails, DI, things of that nature. Uh, just so you can see what's in core. So the, with core, that's where we talked about interfaces. We talk about aggregates. Uh, think of those as like a big container that holds other things, it holds entities. And then there's these things called domain events. So here we have like, for example, when you delete a, a contributor, who needs to know about it? There's probably somebody else who needs to know about it and do something with it. So we're gonna say that when we delete a contributor from our database, we're gonna throw this, uh, not throw like throw an exception, but we're going to publish and say, hey, this contributor was deleted. Then it's got a handler. So you can see what that looks like. The handler is going to be like, oh, you deleted a contributor. Let me handle that. And so you can see what is it going to do? It's going to clear out. So dealing with objects and consistency, especially when you're dealing with domain-driven development, you have different consistency levels. So you have the uh, consistency where you go and your data is in sync. And then there's eventual where it takes a little bit for it to be in sync across multiple databases. And so in here, you can see here, they talk about eventual consistency where you remove the contributors uh, projects when one is deleted. So you're deleting the contributors themselves from the projects. You're not deleting the projects though, because there could be other contributors on those projects. You just need to delete the contributors from those projects. So that's what's going on here. So again, what happens when you delete a contributor? You put out a notification of, hey, we're deleting this guy or this person. And then everything that's listening, the handler will be like, I got this. Let's do whatever else we need. You'll also see things like the specification pattern. Again, so that you're not writing queries all throughout your code. You want to capture them in a spot that makes sense. But you can see here using the specification pattern and we're using the Ardella specification package that you can then say, okay, I've got my query, but also pass in where the contributor is set to that. We use specifications in a lot of our uh, projects because it just makes it a lot easier to have our query stuff located nicely and written cleanly. All right, so we've got the core, interfaces, aggregates, Handlers, specifications, uh, project specifications, just a bit more. Again, so you could see, like, how do we do a search? And what are we searching for? And there's the where clause. So much easier than writing SQL statements all over and putting the where clauses in. Oh, to think of writing your SQL statements as strings and then doing the injection of where clauses and appending them to the strings and running the risk of SQL injection. Oh, we don't want to do that. Specification makes our life a lot easier in that regard. Okay, so that's core. Core is all the things at the lower level. You also see things like project and priority status. I'll show you what those look like. I did not want to collapse that. I want to collapse specifications. So project, this is an entity. Notice, so when we talk about entities and aggregates, this comes from domain-driven design, DDD. Um, I, the way I like to talk about those is aggregate. Think of it as it is a collection of there's entities. There could be things called value objects 
which are usually just properties without the identifier. Entities have a unique identifier. So you'll see here for this particular aggregate, the project aggregate, it has its project. It also has to-do item would belong to it as well. That's why we call this aggregate root, because when you access a project, you'll access its items through the project. You won't be able to access those items individually. It doesn't make sense to access them individually. You usually have them in the context of, okay, here's a project. Okay, now let's see the items. Okay, now I want to access them. So more or less like order and order items, I suppose. So yes, same. that is exactly like order and order items. Correct. Correct. So in this case, it's project and project in the, the project's items. Because you typically aren't going to do those items by themselves, other than maybe creating them and updating them, but that's still through the project context. So that's why they are all considered as part of that aggregate. And project is considered the aggregate root because that's got the public ways of accessing those. Uh, and you'll see like priority status, things like that. In our code, you see these guard against. Those are the guard clauses that I mentioned on the slide about what kind of things are in there. Uh, so guard clauses is another one of the Ardalis projects. So Ardalis guard clauses. And you can also do custom guard clauses. So when I do the thank you email to go out, I'll make sure to include, we have a blog post on how to do that as well. But what's nice about the guard clauses is your validation checks are much more concise. You don't have null checks thrown all about your code. If this is null here, if this is null there, no, just guard clauses and make it easier. All right, so project in this case is both an entity and an aggregate root. But project status, notice it's just a simple enum. We have, again, a to-do item. So this goes back to the, they are an entity that belongs to the project aggregate. And again, with clean architecture, that goes into the core. So we've looked at core, we've looked at infrastructure. Let's look at use cases, because use cases is the new one. So last time we looked at clean temp the clean architecture template, we didn't have these use cases. This is where we get into CQRS. This is where we get into the commands and their handlers and the queries and their handlers. And so you can see here, like, when I create a contributor, what is that going to do? Well, it's got a command. And you'll notice here that it's working with Ardalis's shared kernel. So his new shared kernel project that we we're talking about, it's another package. But there's the I command result, and this is coming back as an int. So we've got that. Now the handler, what, what's going to happen with that? So we've got this command. The handler is going to be like, I got this command. This is how we deal with it. And so then you notice here that the command or the handler is going to take in a repository, and it's going to use that repository to then process the add in this case. And you'll find similar patterns with delete and with update. So you're going to see a, a command to, hey, I need you to deal with this object. I need you to create it. I need you to update it. I need you to delete it. They're going to be handlers for each of those commands. Those handlers will do whatever needs to be processed. Typically, you're going to see your handler has a repository and it does something. Or it may have, in this case, you see it has a service. And then it'll call the service and call the delete and all the notes that Steve has in there. Now, when you're talking about getting something, so commands, you're doing some kind of write, gets, those are your queries. And you'll notice here with your get contributor query that it has a handler as well. So queries and commands both have handlers. The thing to note with this one, so you're gonna see this particular one refers to the contributor by ID spec. Using this specification pattern makes it, again, easier for you to say, OK, I want you to run this query. And it's cleanly written. It's not You're not running with uh, raw SQL strings anymore. And it's all in one spot. So your spec is somewhere managed. It's not like scattered throughout the code. Here's this particular word clause. And now i got to edit it in three or four different spots. Nope, it's right there. You'll see here that there's a, a, a link query with the first for default. This is going to return. Notice here the contributor DTO. Where do you think that DTO lives? Lives here. In the, 
in the infrastructure. In, so in this case, it actually lives with the use cases because this is the okay. only place that where that needs it. So, and it's just a record in this case. So that's the query and we've seen commands. Now I want to show list so you can see that we take a different approach there and that we also have a query service. And this query service is an interface. So now we have an interface in the use cases. Who's going to implement that? So you can see here, Autofact is going to take care of the dependency stuff, but this is actually used. You can see there's infrastructure queries. And then within the infrastructure queries, you can come into here and see, oh, look what's going on. It implements that interface. The interface is done with use cases. So if you remember on the picture, infrastructure can talk to core. Infrastructure can also talk to use cases. And this is why. So this is what happens here is the interface is defined in this case in use cases. Now, why do we have to deal with this over in infrastructure land? Because we're dealing with the AppDB context and getting that injected and making sure that that's set up properly. So that's why we have that reference between infrastructure and use cases is because we have these query services. Sometimes you'll have a service, sometimes you don't. It depends on the code that you're writing and whether it makes sense or not. Is still mediator in place here? What's that? Is the mediator in place here? Uh, mediate, I believe mediator is still in place here, yes. Okay. And of course the tests. You can see there's, there's the no-op mediator. That's why I was like, eh, I'm pretty sure it's still there. I don't think he took Mediator out because that's one that he continues to talk about to this day. So, so this is the sample. Now to stress it again for those who are watching the recording afterward, this sample folder is not part of the template. It is in the repository where the template lives in a sample folder. So if you go to github.com slash ardalish slash clean architecture, Within that code base, there's a sample folder, and that's where this sample is. Here in my Visual Studio, this is the actual sample. Now, if I flip over to my Visual Studio code, I'm gonna make sure that that flipped over. Okay, so this one here, this is what happens when you create a new template. I'll show you under the, again, no tricks under the covers, look at uh, use cases. There's contributors, but the project is gone. So it is very much shorter in terms of what's included in the template for examples. So use cases in the sample has contributors and projects, but in the uh, template itself, when you generate the solution, you only see this one here, the contributors. Why did we do that? That way you don't have so much that you have to delete when you go to put your own application in there. So try to make it a little bit simpler for that. And again, with the web, contributors, contributor, and that's it. You don't see any of the project stuff. OK. Let's see what we got in the chat. Oh, core. OK. Now, and we saw the REST client calls. We saw the HTTP files. Again, with Visual Studio Code, I'm using a REST client uh, extension. In Visual Studio, full-fledged Visual Studio, that's already built in with Visual Studio 2022. And I'll include that document as well. Uh, with additional resources, just so you're aware, all of these links are going to be included in the thank you email. So don't go, oh, wait, what's this one? What's that one? They'll be there. Uh, we got the importance of the clean architecture. We've got Steve's updates. So this particular URL right here talks about the changes. So this talks about removing shared kernel and adding use cases and what did those all look like. And if you're working with clean architecture in other languages, then you 
you might want to look at things like the one for Go or Java or Python or Rust. If you have another language that you work with that is not in these slides, feel free to drop me an email afterwards. And so just reply to that thank you email and go, hey, do you have any guidance on whatever the language is in clean architecture? Because chances are I probably know where to start for that and I can get you there. I have a programming language problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other thing I want to stress is when you're dealing with clean architecture, check out, Steve has this book here, Architecting Modern Web Apps with ASP.NET Core and Microsoft Azure. The demo he uses is, is eShop on web. I want to make sure that it's clear that if you're doing a search for the demo repo, look up eShop on web. Uh, there's a new one out there that's just called eShop. That's for .NET Aspire. That's not at all anything we're looking at here today. But they've kind of confused things, so I want to make sure we've got it clear on that. And then next month, our webinar has moved up to February 22nd, and we'll be talking about modular monoliths. So sticking with the whole architecture thing, we deal with monoliths. It's the, the thing that we deal with a lot, where you have an application you've inherited, and you're like, OK, what does this one do? And you realize everything's tightly coupled and gross, maybe. Uh, they don't have to be. They could be just a monolith that was very well organized, and it might be a modular monolith already. But nowadays, we're actually talking about it with that term, modular monolith, or a modulith. So we'll talk about what is a modular monolith. We'll talk about, is it a stepping stone towards microservices? Or is that where you stop? Because it could be a stopping point for some. But by the end of that webinar, you'll be able to make that decision for you you and that particular project that you're looking at. So that's February 22nd. Uh, if there's anything we can do at Nimble Pros to help you out in terms of like implementing clean architecture with .NET 8, uh, any .NET 8 migration questions, things like that, these are things that our team can help your team to. Uh, if you want to incorporate DDD, or so domain-driven design in your work environment, that's something else that we're more than equipped to do. And then if you need training for your development team, whether it's clean architecture or any of the topics we've covered in past webinars, if there are topics that you would like to see that we haven't, just reply to that message that I send at the end of these webinars that say thank you with all the links and be like, hey, do you happen to have any webinars coming up on blah? Because chances are we probably do, but if we don't, we now have it on our radar. All right. Are there any questions? I try to stay up on them and chat. Yeah, um, uh, I took some notes. Uh, would you plan any hands-on lab uh, as individuals? Because uh, if you're if you're not part of a team, mm -hmm. if there are any other individuals, and you could uh, provide uh, you know half day or full day some hands-on lab uh, with nimble process is, is something you would manage. Yeah. So I mean, we have done half day workshops and various things so we had a conference back in november and i was able to assist with one of my teammates uh we did test driven development workshops and then i just did an event storming workshop at the beginning of this month so teaching folks about event storming and how you use sticky notes to have those conversations um yeah if you want a clean architecture workshop or any of those just drop us a message so that we can figure out like how we handle it who to deal with things like that. But yeah, that's definitely something within the scope of things we could do. Okay, thank you. Sure. Awesome. And if there's anything else, feel free to reply. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye.